quiet the noise. This is the sound of freedom. If you're listening online, that's what family sounds like. If you're visiting this house for the first time and you're checking us out to see if this is a place that you can call home, that's what family feels like. Welcome. Please, guys, sit down. Um, this, is a, this is an incredible, incredible privilege for me. Um, the road that leads here is long and winding, uh, but it's uh, such an honor to be here tonight. Um, this, uh, Nikki and I have literally come alive in this house. This house has given us new life. I was reborn in this place, in Dubsy's swimming pool. And um, this is a palace of wonder and grace. And we, we love this house. We love to serve this house. And we're so grateful for, for the story that we're a part of. Um, Dill and Mark and Dubsy, you guys have uh, you've helped me to come alive in this place. You've been my friends, my mentors, my leaders, uh, and I appreciate you, and it's such a privilege. Uh, I just want to pray, and then we can get going. Father God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You reign over us, Lord Jesus. You are our protector and our provider, Father God. You are our companion and our king, and we are so grateful, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we can call this place home. Thank you that we could gather around your word. We ask tonight, Lord, that you would bring an anointing over your word, that it would be a rich deposits in people's hearts, and that uh, there would be a shift in the atmosphere, Lord, uh, and that uh, lives would be changed and people could rise up and move forward. Uh, we ask this in your mighty name. And the faithful at five would say, amen. and amen. Um, before, before the service this evening, uh, a couple of the gents prayed for me, and it was such a special time. And, uh, and Andre Barnard gave me such a picture that I just wanted to share very quickly as I, as I share something of my story. He said that uh, at the Passover, um, the blood of the lamb uh, was in a bowl. Each person had the blood of the lamb in a bowl in their home. Uh, and in order for them to show the sign that they'd been saved, that they would need to take that blood and spread it over the doorpost for all to see that they were saved uh, and, and that they would be spared. Uh, and he said that the blood couldn't stay in the bowl. Um, and so f it's for that reason that I share a bit of my story, a bit of my testimony, because it's, uh, it's not my story that I want you to see, it's God's story. It's the, it's the blood of the Lamb. Uh, so Nikki and I moved to Belito uh, in September 2013. And we were married the following February, on the 15th. Um, we moved to Belito for a fresh start, because we'd both been through rather messy divorces. Uh, so we wanted to make a fresh start, and we wanted to get away. No one sets out in marriage to get divorced. No one sets out in a marriage with the end goal to hurt someone and to fail. But that's what I did. I failed my marriage, I failed my marriage partner, I failed God, I let people down, I hurt people. Uh, and it would be easy for me to make up hundreds of excuses about why it happened and how it happened, but the bottom line is, is a simple one, is that uh, God wasn't the golden thread that bound my life, not to anything, not to my job, not to my marriage, not to my family not even to my own body. The Bible wasn't the place I looked when I needed advice. And prayer wasn't where I went if I had a problem. And so if you're in a space like that, you have to accept that, that failure is going to be a part of it. So when the news of Nikki and I's relationship broke, the fallout was extremely severe. Uh, there was recrimination, there was accusation, there was heartache, there was crying, and there was a, there was a lot of pain. And it was uh, exceptionally difficult for me to stare that heartache and pain in the face. Uh, our families came under an incredible amount of pressure, uh, trying to support us, trying to guide us at the same time. It was a hard time for them. It was a hard time for our friends. Camps were divided. And uh, friendships, were, friendships were tested. 
Some of those friendships lasted, and some of them didn't. And, uh, and it was an incredible amount of regret. It was regret for the things I'd done, for the way the story had unfolded, for the timing of things. And so, and so when Nikki and I got together and started our relationship, we were both broken things. And only God wants to use broken things. So we moved to the north coast, if I'm being honest, to hide away. We moved away to hide away. We wanted to go somewhere where we could start again, where no one knew who we were. We wouldn't have to face people uh, who knew what had happened uh, and knew the things that we had done. So we came to hide away. We loved each other. We love each other fiercely and deeply. Uh, but at that time and in that space, there was very much an us against the world mentality. Uh, and although that forged us together forever, it caused us to put up barriers, put up walls, to erect boundaries. And uh, maybe you can find something of that. Maybe you can find something of that in your story. Maybe you've put up barriers, walls. Maybe you're carrying a secret that you think no one else can forgive. Maybe you are carrying hurt or shame or regret. And now uh, that's exactly where the devil wants you to be. He loves to, he loves to barricade you in your own shame. He loves to shackle you to your past and to your regret. He loves for you to stare so long at your sin that you forget to look up. He loves for you to stare so hard at your pain that you are immobilized because he knows then that you're safe for him. He knows then that you're not going to step out. You're not going to take ground. You're not going to build kingdom because you're shackled to your shame and you're hiding in your own story. But I've learned this over and over in the journey that I've traveled. God does not condone sin. He hates it. But he does not condemn people. So that's why the Simple Life series has been so powerful and so stirring. Because it's helped people, it's taught people to look at God as he really is. And to come to know him as he really is. It's taught people to find freedom. It's helped them to find freedom in his story and in his grace. And it's allowed them to discover purpose for, his, for, for the story that he has over their lives. Uh, and that's what I want to talk around t t tonight, is, is finding freedom, discovering your purpose, and using that to make a difference, to make what difference you can in the lives of the people around you. Uh, so I'm a simple guy, and this is the simple, the simple life. So it's going to be some simple points. Uh, <laughs> and I hope, uh, and I hope that uh, someone can take something home. So I'm going to read. We're going to go together uh, to Ephesians. That's the test we've been uh, resting in. We've been camping in over this series, uh, and we, so we're going to pick it up. Ephesians 1, uh, verse 3. Praise be to God and Father our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us in sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the ones he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes upon us, that he lavishes upon us. And I, and I love this text. And I love it uh, for three reasons. Firstly, it's a word in season. This, this, te this text is uh, it's Paul. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. It's about 50 AD. And he's uh, offering them a word of courage and a word of encouragement because uh, Ephesus was at, the, was at the forefront. It was an exploding church at the forefront of the ministry and the mission into, into Asia Minor. And he couldn't be there because uh, he was chained to a wall somewhere in prison. But he wanted to give them courage because he knew that they would face challenges and obstacles as they try to break in 
and spread the gospel. And it's a word, and that was, so that's almost 2,000 years ago, but it's a word and season for us as we look to new horizons, as we look to break new ground. And uh, so, so it's so inspiring. It's so full of love and praise and gratitude and encouragement. And the second reason that I love the text is because of the man who wrote it. It's written by Paul. But we first meet him as Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 7 at the stoning of the disciple Stephen. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want this to be an abstract point, but I don't want to labor it either. But a stoning is, is an ugly thing. It's, it's the slow, systematic breakdown of someone's body to a pulp, to a bloody pulp, by throwing rocks and stones at him until he dies. And there was Saul of Tarsus. They were laying the coats at his feet, and he was watching it. And it says in Acts Verse 60, and he approved, Saul approved of their killing him. You imagine for one second how hard that man's heart must have been. How exact opposite of Jesus Christ he was in that moment standing there. Jesus with a heart full of love and this with a man, a man with a heart full of hatred. An antichrist in that place. And in, and in that, we can find courage because Saul was on the road to Damascus with papers from the high priests to continue the persecution of the Christian church, which, by the way, was a beautiful irony because in them trying to crush it and suppress it, all they managed to do was to spread it. So he was on the road to Damascus carrying his papers from the high priest. And God interrupted him, blinded him, filled him with the Holy Spirit, dropped the scales from his eyes, and released him to become one of the most powerful missionaries for Jesus Christ. So if we, if we are standing in this house, and we think that somehow we are disqualified, that somehow we don't match up, that somehow we've done something so bad that it could never be redeemed, we need to look at Paul. This is a man who was set free. He was redeemed. He was released to become a powerful missionary and to take the gospel to everyone. How many of you know that when God interrupts you, he wants to redirect you? When you're traveling full steam, going 100 miles an hour and the wheels come off, the business fails, ill health sets in, some kind of uh, calamity with your family, and you come to a grinding halt, it's time to pay attention because God's trying to redirect you. So take an hour, take a day, take a week, take a month. Pray and see what God's trying to tell you. So Paul understands grace. He understands how God can redeem you into a new story. And so do I. Now we get to the exciting and the interesting part for us. In verse 11 of Ephesians, the passage I've just read, we jump down to verse 11. It says this. Paul writes this, and he writes it to the church in Ephesus, and he writes it to us today. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. In him we were also chosen. Tap your chest and tell someone really loudly, I am chosen by the living God. Find someone else and tell them louder. I am chosen by the living God. And uh, verse 12 tells us what for. Verse 12 says, I'll tell you what verse 12 says. <laughs> in order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, must be for his glory, must be for his glory. Not build, not claim, not break ground, not go and go and go and go. Be for his glory. Be joyful. 
be patient, be kind, be loving, be supportive, be for His glory. And out of the overflow of that will come actions that change people's lives. But it starts with being. I read somewhere that in the Gospel of John, it says 45 times that Jesus said, I am. I am. Not I do or I save or I do miracles. I am. The act and the art of being. 45 times, I am, I am, I am. Because he understands better than most And as Paul did come to understand, that to be in God is the most important thing first. And from that overflow, from that overflow, will come the actions and the deeds in his time and in his accordance. Not all of us are destined for stories that are written in lights. But all of us, for all of us, There's the love of being in Christ for each other. I love God's sense of humor, and I love how ironic he is. Saul of Tarsus, that was his Hebrew name. But it was common in those times to have two names, a Hebrew name, like Saul of Tarsus, and a Latin name, like Paulus or Paul. Uh, And in his missionary work, Saul of Tarsus chose to call himself Paul. That was obviously something that God put on his heart. So I looked up the meaning of Paul, and it means small, little, humble. Don't you love God's sense of humor? That he would call someone small, little, humble, and he would make him great. And he's telling us the same things tonight, friends. Make yourself small. Make yourself humble. So that when you achieve great things, the glory is His. And we make a difference for His glory. Amen? Okay, is this helpful? Good, I'm getting warmed up. Right, so the next thing, my second bullet, underscore, bold print, uh, I've called, and Nikki said it was important to have the bullets because those are the things that people write down. He said, don't hide and don't hesitate. Don't hide and don't hesitate. See, Paul was that guy. See, the one day, he's marching with papers from the high priest to Damascus to persecute. Got papers, must persecute. A few days later, Messiah! And it says in the text, the people were astonished. And you can imagine the people as, was it, did the guy go, and the word hypocrite would have come up once or twice. Hashtag hypocrite. And don't we do that? Don't we hide? And don't we hesitate behind things that are holding us back or things that we're ashamed of? Don't we hold back because we don't think we're good enough? I can't sing like him. I can't speak like him. I'm not good with people. I couldn't work with children. But not Paul. And I admire that so much about him. Because that wasn't Nikki and our story. We were hiding, deep undercover. Some BT Eco Estate. (laughs) Code to get in. Code to get out. It's safe, babe. We can go to the shops. Okay? And, uh, And the devil loved us to be in that space. And that could have been our story. Two broken people living out broken lives, always wondering if they'd made the right call back in the day. And I'm not sure how we found Link or where we heard about it. 
But we drove up that bumpy, bumpy two-lane track there through the trees. Nikki laughing at me saying, see, I told you we'd get lost. <laughs> and uh, I was just about to say something snarky back and a man in a wetsuit with a snorkel and everything jumped out of a grove of trees and I knew we were in the right place. <laughs> and like, like Dill said earlier, he was leading worship at that time. He was in a season of leading worship, a season I personally think should return. And he was going through, and, and, and the, we were going through a, a, a series of weeks of singing Glorious Ruins. And like Dill says, I, I stood there, and those words washed over me. Like, Dill was using, like God was using Dill to speak to us and to set us free. So as I walked through the fire with my head lifted high and my spirit revived in your story, I looked to the cross as my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace. As the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name, rising up from the ashes, God forever you reign. And Nikki and I found freedom in that moment and in those moments. And freedom is found in a moment and freedom is journeyed out over time. And that's what we've been able to do with the redemption of Christ's love, and with the support of a community of people who know how to make a change and make a difference in other people's lives. And so we've done what we can to, to discover our purpose in Him together, uh, to find freedom together, and to do what little we can to make what difference we can together. Not because it's buying us points in heaven, but because we're so, so grateful for a God who saves. So I just want to encourage you. I just want to urge you. I want to plead with you. That if you're sitting here tonight and you're holding on to something or something's holding on to you, I want you to let it go. I want you to find freedom. I want you to say, tonight is the night that I step forward for Christ. I want to be that guy. I want to be that lady in my family. I want to be that person at work. I want to be that person with my friends. I want people to know my story like the blood on the doorpost. I will hide no longer. You are not disqualified. Jesus loves you. You are blameless in his sight. And he wants to take your story so that you can make a difference in the lives of people. In closing, I was praying so hard into this message. And I was just asking for wisdom. I was saying, Father God, just give me a little bit of Dill and Mark. Just a tiny bit. Just give me something here, Lord. Uh, and he took me to the crucifixion. And uh, he, just, he just showed me so clearly. He said, Stoney, it's Jesus on the cross. And uh, his arms are stretched out as if he's reaching to the thief on his right and as if he's reaching to the thief on his left. And it just spoke to me that in the middle of his pain and suffering, in his darkest hour, he was in the middle of other people's pain and suffering. And the thief on, to his one side mocked him and scoffed at him. And the thief on the other side asked for redemption and was welcomed into paradise. And I just get the... And I just... I just got the feeling that there, in the middle of his pain, in his darkest hour, that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to take his children from where they were. He was trying to reach out a hand to take them from where they were and offer them where they could be and where he wanted them to be. And I have the sense that he wants the same for us and from us. See, even in our darkest hour, 
when the business is failing, when the marriage is breaking down, if there's ill health. He wants us to take our eyes off ourselves. And he wants us to help people to go from cynicism, doubt, mistrust, depression, to love and grace and freedom and faith. And I know that those stories are true because I've seen people like that on the host team that Nixon and I work with, in our family and friends. That's what he wants for us. That's what he, that's what he wants us to do to make a difference. Let's take our eyes off ourselves. Let's look to the people to our left. Let's look to the people to our right. Let's stretch out a hand. That's what this community of people did for me. That's what Jesus did for us. And that's what he wants for you, starting today. Stand, let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for your house. Thank you for your people that reach out to each other, that hold each other, that love each other, that support each other. Thank you, Father God, that your word is a rich and life-giving word, Lord Jesus. Thank you that in our pain and suffering and our hardship, you are there. You are there to lift us up. You are there to give us a new story. You are there to take us forward. You are there for us to be small so that you can be, give, be big. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this night, for these people. Just pray that their stories will be told over and over again so that other people can find freedom. Free people, free people. So we ask for your word to take fruit, Lord, to take to take hold in, in rich soil. And that the fruits of the Spirit will be rich for all to savor, Lord. Love, joy, patience, kindness. We thank you, Father God, that you are the King of the kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And amen.